Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, and Chris Smith. Coming up on DTNS, could 3D printing solve the supply chain crisis? Anchor makes a 3D printer that could help. Plus, why TikTok songs get stuck in your head and whether that Twitter edit function is a good idea. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, April 6th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. We have endeavored to put together a slate of wonderful tech things you should know. Let's give them to you now. Uber will add trains, buses, planes, and car rentals to its app in the UK. The company will partner with providers of these transportation services, building software integrations to let people buy tickets within the app. This will start with Eurostar train bookings with flight integration coming later this year. Uber also says it's looking into integrating hotel bookings. And meanwhile, the San Francisco Chronicle says Uber has reached a deal with Yellow Cab SF and also Flywheel to integrate taxis into Uber's app, similar to what they're doing in New York City. I feel like Uber's just becoming a transportation app, a, a how to get things places, including you and, and pizza. pizza and yeah. pizza. AMD confirmed that a bug in its GPU drivers changes the settings of Ryzen CPUs in BIOS, BIOS without something that they call in the industry your permission. Uh, some users reported seeing auto overclocked CPUs. And don't forget, AMD typically warns that overclocking CPUs can void its warranty. The company said it will share more information on the bug soon. German police seized servers and Bitcoin used by the Tor network website Hydra, which had been in operation since 2015. Flashpoint and Chainalysis both estimate the marketplace had annual revenue of $1.37 billion, facilitating the sale of narcotics, fake documents, and other illegal or great market goods to 17 million customers. It also operated the Bitcoin bank mixer, which laundered money through cryptocurrency transactions. Google announced a new AI architecture called Pathways Language Model, or Palm, a 540 billion parameter model designed with few shot learning, which reduces the number of task specific training examples needed to adapt the model to a particular application. In other words, it doesn't need bounds of data every time it needs to learn a new thing. It can use what it learned from other things, which is how humans learn. Google claims it outperforms other AI language models and average human performance in benchmarks with notable performance understanding arithmetic and common sense reasoning tasks, as well as generating explanations of text, including, and most importantly, jokes. Meta announced it will not hold its F8 developer conference this year while it gears up for new initiatives like the metaverse. It will still hold other developer conferences, such as Conversations, which is focused around messaging that comes on May 19th, and Connect, which focuses on VR and AR and more metaverse-oriented things. Yeah, so metaverse. Makes sense. All right, yeah. I get it. Let's talk a little more about TikTok. Let's do it. According to a 2011 study from Finnish researcher Lassie A. Likkanen, 90% of people have songs stuck in their head at least once a week. I am one of that 90%, very much so. Another article from the Kennedy Center on earworms, which is the term for music that you can't stop hearing in your mind, says the Germans were talking about the phenomenon at least 100 years ago, calling it orworm. Researchers from Dartmouth College also found that the audio cortex in your brain activates in the same way it does when you're actually listening to the song versus imagining the song. CNET's Erin Carson uh, wrote up a really interesting article. Uh, she re reached out to a researcher who studies earworms, Kalula Kingingly, at the Queensland University of Technology. And uh, Kingingly says, people aren't imagining things when they get songs stuck in their heads. She describes the Zig Arnick effect, saying, quote, leaving a task unfinished results in a sense of tension because you feel psychologically compelled to finish the task. So your mind can't let go of that task. End quote. You might say, OK, well, what if I listen to the whole song? Well, you probably wouldn't if it were, say, a TikTok video because the videos are too short to play an entire song. And there's a whole looping thing if you keep it going. No one has studied TikTok earworms specifically yet, but Killingly says there's other research that explores how repetition helps get songs stuck in your head. So I think this is fascinating. As a big TikTok user, uh, 
this happens to me all the time. So I was, uh, we were, you know, when I when I thought about this, um, when we knew this was coming up on discussion, I was starting to think of the various ones that get stuck in my head and why. And some of them are ones I've heard for months, so it's not like a brand new song I've heard, but now I can't get it out of my head. The problem with TikTok is you only hear that thing for as long as the thing runs. So let's say it's a 20 second, 30 second, or even less, let's say 10 second on the average loop of a song. Uh, it's often what I find anyway is I'll later hear the full song and it really throws me for a loop. So if there's tension being caused by me not having the sort of conclusion of a song and hearing it right then, I think I'm adding tension by hearing the full song later and then having that weird 10 second bit jump out so hard while the rest of the song feels new and fresh to me. Um, so I think there's a lot, probably a lot to learn about how our brains behave this way, why they behave this way. But I can tell you what, if anything, this tells me stop watching TikToks before bed because <laughs> I, I don't need to go to bed with more tension. I have enough of that as it is. Yeah, so, there's the blue light. There's the social media stressor. Now there's the TikTok song is going to get stuck in your head and keep you awake. There's so yeah. many reasons now. Yeah. I mean, I so getting a song stuck in my head is is actually an ongoing problem of mine. I recently rewatched the movie Bridesmaids. Funny movie. At the end, if you, it, I don't think this is a spoiler. Uh, Wilson Phillips performs the song "Hold On," which is a like, you know beloved you know late '80s song. I have had I watched that movie I don't know a week ago. I have had that song in my head, like waking up in the middle of the night in my head the entire week since watching the movie. I think I listened to the entire song. I'm not totally sure, but I I I really am fascinated by why this sort of thing you know, replays in our minds. And I think, I think, uh, uh, you know, Aaron Carson's deep dive into why this happens and the, the brain wanting to complete something has a lot to do with it. Yeah, for sure. Listen, out West, we're a little lax. So if you say so that this is a savage problem, then I'll tap in and look in this box and see if I can name any other TikTok songs that are super hot <laughs> right now. Um, <laughs> Man, I, I'm trying to think of the name, actually, of the one that Eileen's been wa walking around singing constantly for the past couple of weeks because she's seen it everywhere. But it feels to me like TikTok was designed to stick songs in your head, which may be true. <laughs> Maybe like it started as musically, right? Uh, and and Duyen in, in China, like the whole idea was like, let's make people engage. How do we engage? Catchy songs. How do we do catchy songs? Short bits so that it gets stuck in their head and mm -hmm. then they want to go back and listen to the whole song to get it out of their head. But on TikTok, we'll never give them the whole song. So it'll be a fool's errand and they'll come back and never get it out of their head. I mean, it's kind of how it's supposed to work. It is how it's supposed to work. And there's been great success, like uh, empirical or otherwise, where you can say, look, this artist sold a ton of CDs or this artist who started on TikTok playing their guitar and singing now has a recording contract and a career and is doing great. You know, you could say the same thing about people's upstarts and things like SoundCloud and other places. So it already is kind of a hotbed for that to have that kind of outgrowth. The problem is for us, for us who are just listening to it, A, it gets stuck in our head. We don't have the full context or song. And then when we do hear the song, it just feels weird. And so I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I feel like TikTok should be better at like working with the record labels to say, this is just a piece of this song. You want the whole thing? Like, go get it. <laughs> I mean, TikTok doesn't care about they that. They don't care. I don't think they care about that. <laughs> and it's unfortunate because like there, there's a couple of songs. Like I really like Post Malone. I'm a big fan. Me and too. I really like yeah. uh, there's some there's some songs on his most re recent 2019 album that I just think are classics and amazing. But there's a couple in there that I first heard on TikTok and it was mm -hmm. just a little teeny bit, a little bit how I first heard Sunflower on Spider-Verse, the movie. And uh, because of that, I now associate those things with a fail video on TikTok or with a Spider-Man animated feature or or whatever. So I can't actually enjoy those songs, I think, the way they were intended to be. And I hate to keep harping on that, but that's part of the problem and part of our brain hang up. So if we're going to do further study about this, I, I hope they keep that stuff in mind too, because you never want to be sick of 10 seconds, but super stoked about the other three and a half minutes. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, we, we, we have some tips from Dr. Pat Conlon uh, in Thailand of how to get a song out of your head if it gets stuck in there. Uh, so don't listen before bed. We talked about that. Don't repeat songs. Uh, listen all the way through. Apparently, if you go find the actual song, listen all the way through, that gets it out. Chewing gum apparently disrupts 
the part of your brain that does the earworm, that can work. Walking out of step with the beat of the song stuck in your head, uh, not thinking about it too much uh, is, is another one. And uh, and literally said, if an earworm lasts more than 24 hours, you might want to talk to your doctor because there are some, <laughs> some I will problems. be calling my doctor yeah. shortly after this <laughs> broadcast. I mean, it feels like there are <laughs> because times. Because Wilson Phillips has been in my head more than 24 hours. If Wilson Phillips lasts more than 24 hours. Consult your physician. <laughs> yeah. Side yeah. effects include vomiting and <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let's get to this one. Associate Professor Soon Kulad of De Montfort University published an article on The Conversation describing a paper he co-authored about why some countries in Africa, uh, he used South Africa and Kenya as examples, might do what's called leapfrog into manufacturing because of 3D printing. Now, let's talk a little bit about leapfrogging. Leapfrogging is when an area adopts a new technology faster and reaps more benefit from it than a seemingly more developed area because the more developed area is locked into using the older technology and therefore adapts to the new stuff slower. A great example of this is mobile payments. They were adopted and became widespread in African countries like Kenya and Pesa being the big example because they didn't have another way to do easy payments. They didn't have a credit card system that was as developed uh, and the rest of the, the world uh, took longer to, to catch up with them. Collad and colleagues suggest that 3D printing uh, also benefits by avoiding logistics and supply chain issues, waste less material, and can reuse what it does waste. Uh, so it's efficient, it's useful for small shops, for working from home, and the skills of current manufacturers aren't applicable to 3D printing. So you're not gonna see big manufacturers immediately send a bunch of their people into doing it. And the immediate profitability is also not there. So the big manufacturers aren't gonna do that because of the slow adoption of it. That's a perfect recipe for leapfrogging. Uh, he suggests that governments encourage retraining programs to get people up and running with 3D printing. South Africa apparently has a good one. But the easier 3D printers get, the less training will be needed. And granted, industrial printers get a lot of the attention these days, and rightly so, they have an outsized impact. But for leapfrogging, home printers play a big part. And China's Anchor, the maker of fine accessories for your phone and car, just announced a 3D printer that might make it even easier to start your home printing business. The Anchor Make M5 3D comes in two halves. You just connect the two with eight screws, plug into USB-C cables, plug in the power, and you're up and running. It's a very easy to assemble 3D printer. And it prints fast too. Anchor says it will print at 250 millimeters per second out of the box. The Verge's Sean Hollister notes that that's five times as fast as an Ender 3 Pro. It's about five times as fast as most of them. The other thing Anchor promises is ease of use. You'll be able to send designs directly to it over Wi-Fi, either from your own device or sometimes straight from the cloud. It accepts G-code and uses standard nozzles, so it should be able to build a community. And it has a webcam for monitoring print jobs and recording videos. It will also use an algorithm to pause your print job if it notices it's going bad and send you an alert. The Anchor Make launched on Kickstarter yesterday at the early bird price of $499. Anchor expects it will eventually sell at retail for $759, so it's a steal right now. Uh, shipping is expected to begin in September, partly because they don't have the whole thing ready yet. They, they told The Verge the hardware is at 75% and the software is at 2%. Feels like a chance for uh, a big leap forward, and I don't mean in the in the tech itself. It sounds like you know, it's not like we're gonna we're gonna uh, break open brand new ways of three D printing things. But Anchor is known for like really super efficient accessories, parts, and pieces to your tech world, and they sell a ton of them. And I've never been unhappy with a piece of Anchor hardware. Um, I even like their packaging. I feel like they just make a nice, classy piece of hardware whenever I need something from them. Um, so the idea that Anchor's doing it is exciting to me. The idea that they could potentially bring affordable 3D printing to a much larger audience is very exciting. And somebody somewhere needs to be a, I don't know if the word mainstream is not the right word, but somebody who's just a little higher up in the notoriety department who makes a lot of stuff, people know the name, to start really pushing 3D printer technology. Um, right now it's fine. You find companies you trust, but they're usually names that you've never heard of before. And you got to do a ton of research to see who you trust and uh, all the big names that you know aren't making it yet. I feel like maybe Anchor's got an opportunity here that could push them further, certainly further ahead in this particular market, but just make them a more household name. Yeah, 
Um, BioCal was asking uh, if it has a self-leveling bed because one of the ways you get faster is not having the thing fall off, <laughs> uh, which can be a problem. I, I know from a lot of people who do this. Uh, two belts instead of one, two lead screws instead of one, a textured build service, a die-cast aluminum base for weight, and yes, algorithms for self-leveling. So uh, I don't know if it works, but uh, it sounds like they've got all the things that you would want. Uh, to make this easier. To me, it feels like MakerBot was either the Heath kit or, or maybe the Apple One or or even Apple II uh, of 3D printing. And, and Anchor's making a bid to, I don't know if they're quite the Mac. Maybe they're the Amiga uh, of 3D printing. We'll see. That's a good way of putting it. I feel like they 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 have enough of a reputation that they can do, uh, they can kind of straddle a line here and be a thing people see as discount and less money. And I get them on Amazon and they're cheap and whatever but good quality and then but they're also not some huge expectation on them the way it would be if this was google or apple or somebody else making making this device so i think they have an advantage there mm -hmm. and moreover we just need to start getting to a place where you know if we want them to be something in the household as a normal item it's got to yeah. be able to be it's got to start being easy for me to walk up to one and yeah. go i broke this on my chair 3D print me a new one. Perp. Which would make it there more it the Mac. Yeah. I, I, Beatmaster's reminding me the Amiga didn't have a great fate. So, so that's so a good I point. Should, yeah. I just, I, you know, I feel like for the last decade, um, it, you know, every year at CES, you got the 3D area, uh, 3D printing area, and you go, oh, cool. You, you know, lots, lots of cool stuff. Um, yeah. When does this become something that everybody's just got a 3D printer on their home the way that you just have a printer, right? Maybe yeah. you don't yeah. use it every day, but you've got it in case you need it. And it, it surprises me that we, we kind of are still in that hobbyist phase rather than, mm -hmm. oh, the essential phase where you, you have to have that or else you're just going to overpay for something that you could just make yourself. Yeah. yeah, PCs made a big splash in the early 80s and then stayed in the hobbyist phase, if you remember, until the early 90s when they when it was the internet that really started to, to, to bring them around to, to more mainstream mm -hmm. appeal, as well as the Mac. Uh, I, I don't know, anchors, like you said, they're great at design. So, yeah, and it's just anchor. hard to, to know when your tipping point is ready. So maybe they're making a big bet on this is it. This might yeah. be the time. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're not. But it's an in, it's certainly an interesting attempt. Well, uh, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. If you're uh, feeling social out there, I know this is what you're going to say. Uh, you want to get in touch with the DTNS audience on the socials. Let us know if you're a 3D printer, uh, if you're actually a 3D printer, because that would be amazing. Those <laughs> algorithms are getting really good. Uh, let us know, at DTNS Show on Twitter and at DTNS Picks on Instagram. Well... As if waiting for our show to finish recording at 2.31 p.m. Tuesday, Twitter posted the following. All right. I saw this pop live and it kind of freaked me out. Yes, we've been working on an edit feature since last year, says the tweet. No, we didn't get the idea from a poll. We're kicking off testing within Twitter Blue Labs in the coming months to learn what works, what doesn't, and what's possible. Twitter head of consumer product Jay Sullivan said... The feature would need things like time limits, controls, and transparency about what has been edited. It will take input before launching the future. Um, so why is this such a big deal? Why do people? Why are people talking about this today as if it's the biggest thing that ever happened on Twitter? I have a couple of theories. My main one is they've been asking for this feature forever, and now that we have to make rubber meet road, Twitter has to figure out how best to implement it. And you're probably, my, my opinion is, even though they're testing this with Twitter Blue, you're probably not going to get to use this unless even when it's finished unless you're a twitter blue subscriber oh for I sure would, I, I would imagine well, because yeah. this is the you know it's the most requested feature on twitter since the dawn of twitter yeah. uh you know it, it's become a joke at this point that the company is just never going to let you edit tweets so uh i i i don't know why it would become a free feature when it could be something that people pay a few dollars a month to have that said uh, thank you, Elon Musk. No, I'm just kidding. Obviously, Twitter's been working on this for 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 some time. Um, it, you know, it's obviously been under wraps, and I I can't remember the last time I tweeted something and went like, ah, that was there was a typo or look stupid or you know let me delete and you know repost it type of thing. But it's happened. Happens to all of us. Uh, you know, if you tweet regularly enough, it's going to happen to you. That said. Uh, Jay Sullivan, Twitter's Jay S Sullivan saying, okay, well, you know, we really have to, you know, think about transparency, time limits. That'll be interesting because there are plenty of other social networks that let you edit something and, you know, it shows up as edited. Uh, I don't know, you know, in Slack, for example, is another example of when something gets edited, it's pretty clear that that has happened. 
And I, I wonder why it's so much harder for Twitter to just not turn this on without overthinking it. Yeah. I, I, those are all really good points and, and who knows what the real answers are, but I can tell you, I just finished 30 days of Twitter blue subscription. I wanted to try it. Mainly I wanted to talk about it here and we haven't really had an opportunity yet, but I wanted now to we do. know, yeah, know what happened there. So for $2.99 a month, you can sign up for this Twitter blue thing. Among some of its features are things like, uh, we're going to feed you some ad free content from publishers that you trust. So this verge article, for example, will have no ads on it. As long as you stay within the browser that's, you know, that we're using within Twitter, yeah. this is a ad free experience. Um, there's a few things like that, but the main feature for me to, to test was there was a time delay kind of like Gmail where you've sent them an email and you want to undo cause you, you messed up and you want to change it before you send it again. That got built into that baked into that. And for me, that's as good as an edit feature in yeah. a lot of ways, or it's at least a good start toward that. The problem is implementation on it is really, really terrible. And so my feedback for them moving forward with this is to keep UI and user experience in mind at all times, because the reason I canceled, the only reason I canceled is because when you go to send it and it says, are you sure anything you want to change gives you a little time window to make your decision, whether you decide to edit or whether you decide to say, no, go ahead and send it or just let it send on its own after the time expires. All of that takes you to a whole nother page where it's just that tweet. So if you were in a thread or you're looking at a larger discussion, you've got to go back and find where you were. It doesn't leave you there hmm. like a normal tweet does. So normal Twitter behavior is I do a reply. It puts it right where it was. And I don't leave the discussion. This feature made you leave the discussion every time. And it actually made my experience with Twitter way worse. Uh, desktop was fine, by the way. The implementation there was fine the way they handled it. But just a bad user experience on the phone. Maybe that'll get better. Features like this will make me interested in the possibility of re-upping for, for Blue. Um, and maybe to beta test this, there's some interest in my head for this. But anyway, based on that experience, I'm a little concerned that they, it's not that they won't do it. It's that they may do it kind of wrong and not notice that they're doing it wrong. So anyway, take that the, for what the you biggest, will. The biggest fear of them doing it wrong isn't the UI, sadly. Although you've made a good case that maybe it should be. The no. biggest fear that I've seen people say about them doing it wrong is people will use this to cause misinformation. They'll use it to troll people. They'll say something, get a, bit, a bunch of responses, then they'll edit it uh, to say something else and make everybody look foolish. I actually don't care that much about the Twitter edit button. I'm very confused why people are, uh, this is the most requested feature. I, I get why people want it, but I don't understand why it's so requested. Uh, and I, I should be the one who wants it the most because I make typos like crazy. However, I get why people are worried about the edit button and yet every other service has it and none of those fears have come to pass facebook's problem is not that it has an edit button and people use it to spread misinformation they just spread it right the first time uh and 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 the way facebook does this is uh it includes an indication that something has been edited and lets you see the versions and, and, and go back and say, oh, this is what they changed so that you can easily uncover if somebody's, you know, trying to troll everybody. And therefore, it, it, Facebook never gets used that way. And I don't see why Twitter would. Maybe people will in like the first few days, but over and over and over again, other platforms have implemented an edit button and it has not uh, realized all the fears that, that people say about it. And that said, I still don't get why it's the most requested. It's so weird to me. Yeah, maybe it's because there aren't many features we need. And so everyone just freaks out about the one we never get. Well, know. and I think it, it, it's something that I think a lot of people go, well, that would be pretty easy. Just offer it. And it's been so mm -hmm. many years since Twitter was like, we'll offer lots of other things except that one. But, but still, why why don't people just let it go? And like, well, I guess they'll never do it. Why does it become this campaign issue? This thing where people are cheering, where Elon Musk can get everybody all fired up, where there's an April 1st post. Like, I still yeah. don't understand. Like, you know, I think why... part of it is just, we have, it's been memed. It's a memification of a, of yeah, a problem. And so it. because of so many years, it's now become this joke. And now how do you get it's out from that? It's self-propelling. I, yeah, I, I think it's, I, I it's feel Twitter's like fault. They should have done this a long time ago. It seemed to me, and maybe this is just, you know, I'm, I'm overthinking it again, but it seemed to me that Twitter was deliberately not allowing this so people could talk about it so that there's more fanfare when the feature was actually uh, uh, announced. Yeah, I guess uh, trying to figure out why some things never die on the internet while other things do is still something that 
scientists debate. So <laughs> Wilson Phillips, they would know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I bet you didn't think that I was going to talk about talking mushrooms today, but you mm. would be wrong. The Royal Society Open Science published a research article by Andrew Adamatsky of the Unconventional Computing Laboratory at the University of the West of England in Bristol called Language of Fungi Derived from Their Electrical Spiking Activity. You should read it if you want to know the actual science. There's a lot of details in there. We will summarize it the best we can. We found it notable that a fungus can talk with noted vocabularies from the researchers of up to 50 words, that the distribution of those fungal word lengths closely matched those of human languages. From the abstract, quote, fungi exhibit oscillations of extracellular electrical potential. The scientists analyzed electrical activity of ghost fungi, enoki fungi, and split gill fungi. They assumed that the spikes were used to communicate in a micellular network and grouped the spikes into words for linguistic analysis. The uh, split gill fungi had the most complex sentences. Adamatsky said, quote, we do not know if there's a direct relationship between spiking patterns in fungi and human speech. Possibly not. On the other hand, there are many similarities in information processing in living substrates of different classes, families, and species. I was just curious to compare. Uh, man, the split gill Psh, fungi vocabulary is just ridiculous, right? Like they, you ever sit down with a split gill fungi and you're like, whoa, college <laughs> yeah. boy, you know, hey, using your yeah. $6 words. I, we get it. You have an MBA. I, I totally prefer a conversation with a ghost fungi because yeah. of that. It's just more straightforward. Yeah, if you can. I mean, uh, we've mentioned before the show and I'm going to bring it up now. So Star Trek people beware, but um, I'm now starting to think that Star Trek Discovery was onto something with this whole, we're going to travel through space much faster because turns out space mushrooms have all kinds of cool ways to make things happen in space. Because I kind of thought it was real dumb before. Now I'm not sure I was right. Maybe yeah. it's cool. I mean, some of this was already known before this particular paper, sure. and that's what they were riffing on in Discovery. But it is really cool to see like, oh, no, we didn't disprove it. We just took it a little bit farther yeah. into understanding the mycelial network whether we can use it to traverse space and time eh, that that remains to be proven yeah just be careful out there mushrooms are both tasty and scary at the same be careful time. out there what is this hill street blues <laughs> <laughs> span new to your mushrooms uh well thanks to you scott johnson for being with us today what is new in your world well there's always a million things uh there's tons of podcasts to go listen to and all that stuff at frogpants.com but today i'd like to recommend people check out my comic uh although i've been a little lax lately on getting it done um with so many other projects going on check out fredandcan.com it's all about a guy who lives in a house with a sentient can of cream corn and hilarity ensues often to the expense of fred uh but I think you might like it. It's a little bit different, which was the goal, is to make something that nobody else was making. And I really enjoy doing it. I hope you like it as well. Go check it out. It's at fredandcan.com. And for everything else, poke me on Twitter. I'm at Scott Johnson. I'm so glad Fred and Can is back. Uh, Yay, I, I it. like Fred, and I really like Can. Oh, okay. Can's the best. Uh, yeah, also, the best. I also like brand new bosses, don't we all? We have a new one mm -hmm. today, and that boss's name is Jason. Jason just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Also, you know what Jason gets? He's going to get live with it. He's going to get columns from Roger. He's going to get all kinds of cool stuff. I just posted the monthly briefing on Patreon. Jason gets all that. Do you? Mm hmm yeah mm. think, think about that there's a longer version of the show called good day internet also for patrons patreon.com slash dtns is where you can learn more about that and a reminder that we are live monday through friday at 4 p.m eastern 20 hundred utc and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live we are back tomorrow with nika munford joining us talk to you then Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>